Good morning. The, uh, my name is uh, Bernie Anger, you know, and uh, about two years ago, I had an opportunity of starting to run a business within GE, which we call Control and Communication Systems. And we, in that, in, in, in starting that job, we decided to just go through a process of uh, reinventing our, our business. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is share the story with you, you know. I live in a world that most of you don't think about. You know, you expect water to show up at the tap when uh, you wake up in the morning and want to take your shower. You expect the beer to have the right product when you just open it up at the, uh, at the store. You expect, you know, oil to magically come from a, uh, from a hole in the ground through a pump into the uh, fuel tank of your car. But the reality is behind all of those modern conveniences is a network of what we call control systems. You know, so these are systems that in real time and in pretty environmentally hardened conditions ensures that we can actually automate processes that make our modern lifestyle possible. So what do one of these uh, first control systems I need to learn how to run is the little keypad thing here. So here we go. So what do these things actually look like? You know, the, uh, basically a control system is something, is a concept that actually started in, in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, when companies like uh, Ford and, uh, and General Motors were actually just uh, trying, were getting overwhelmed by the notion of changing lines every year and actually having to rewire a whole bunch of electromechanical relays to do so, you know. So basically that was a replacement of sort of electromechanical processes with, uh, with electronics. Today, a control system has become more sophisticated, but in essence, what it actually does is it actually allows a developer with, a, with an IDE not different than what you would use if you're, if you're building sort of an iPhone type application to build a, a real time system without having to deal with the complexities of real time. Once they build that system, the, the second thing that these systems do is actually they can run forever in places where you don't want to live. So these things actually run at you know, minus 40 degrees C, plus 70 degrees C. You can shake them, you can vibrate them, you can shock them, and they continue to run. And they have one final characteristic which is pretty unique, which is even when they fail, they actually they do so in a predictable way. So if you think about a control system, for example, filling a water tank at your local town, if the control system were to fail and the pumps are running and they keep running, after a while, actually, this thing would show up in the news, and actually, that's not good for everybody. So, so essentially, control systems have, uh, have this enormous impact in our, in our daily life, and there's an infrastructure of equipment that runs them. And the reality is most of that infrastructure was built you know, in the 70s and 80s and actually has created an industry that's very, very conservative. I mean, it's actually conservative for the right reasons. You know, if you're the person in charge of a control system, your appetite for this control system failing and the associated asset to stop working is not very high. Imagine you're running a you know, gas turbine and you're producing electricity for the entire city. You're not really going to go experiment with new technology in that, in that type of setting. Yet we were convinced that this actually environment is pressed to evolve. And it's going to press to evolve essentially for two reasons. The first one is, whether I like it or not, people get older. You know, people like me are just uh, getting older. And the key thought behind this stuff is we talk a lot about this digital generation and people think about, you know, think about their kids playing video games and blah, blah, blah. But here's the real meaningful piece of the digital generation. And I'm, I'm going to illustrate this one with a personal story. You know, I spent some time with GE in, uh, in Latin America. I came back a couple of years ago. My daughter was uh, on her way to college and we went to the, uh, to, uh, uh, one of the cell phone carrier stores to buy her a device, you know, buy her, buy her a smartphone. So actually, we went in, went to the store, bought her, bought her phone, and then on the way, on the way out, I just go, so Katerina, the cool phone, no? So I just I bought an, an, uh, an iPhone, which is essentially the same device that had been carried for a couple of years. Said, so I guess now your afternoon is going to be all about getting your information into it. And my daughter kind of looks at me and says, you know, Dad, you know, while you were still in there, I'm a bit of a geek, so I just probably spent a little bit more time than usual at the store. The uh, says, while you, while you were in there, I just went on Facebook, I sent a note that said, new device, need your info, and I already have everything I need. And this is why this is a big deal. It's because she was using the same technology I was, you know. I would have spent four hours with two fingers getting information to the phone. She did in five minutes what I would have done in four hours, right? That's point number one. Point, that's productivity. You know, five minutes, four hours, that's productivity. Point number two, even more important, she didn't do any work. She got the community to do the work. And that is the fundamental transformational thought. You know, when we think about empowering the next generation of people in whatever land of business we're in, this is all about allowing the community to do the work. And if you're not doing that, you're going to be run over. You're essentially going to be run over. The second thing that's, that's uh, exciting in here 
is this idea of uh, Internet of Machines. You know, the first decade and a half of the Internet was really all about connecting people to machines. A lot of the applications, when we think about Internet, what do we think? We think about booking travel online. We think about, you know, some kind of shopping experience. We think about information gathering. The next 10 years are about connecting machines to machines. And when, when I say that, people say, well, sure, you're going to connect the expensive stuff. I've got to tell you, if you speak with people like Ericsson, they're telling you, no, we're going to instrument cows. We're going to put, you know, we'll connect cows to the machine so that if the temperature in a cow rises as part of a herd, we can identify her and separate her before the rest of the herd gets sick. So if people are thinking about connecting animals or, or cows to a, to a machine, and this is not a, there's no ethical statement behind what I'm, I'm telling, I'm just trying to illustrate this idea of connecting everything to everything. We, we're really uh, going to start looking at a bit of a different set of applications that go together with that, right? The, uh, if the first, uh, the first wave of the internet connected about a billion and a half devices, we're talking about connecting about 100 billion over the next uh, seven or eight years. And that actually enables a complete new set of applications, you know? We, we can start thinking about untethering a lot of things that we were not thinking about doing before. So think about a, a, a network of trains. Today we have a lot of expensive signaling on the ground to run trains, you know? You can actually start thinking, if you can assume connectivity, you can start thinking about managing that same network with essentially a virtual set of, uh, of signals. I mean, probably the most spoken about area in terms of uh, Internet of Machines is this idea of the smart grid, this idea that instead of having producers and consumers of electricity, everybody can be a producer or a consumer depending on the economics and the actual need. That actually requires some infrastructure underneath that. So those two things cannot be addressed with the infrastructure or the control technology that's been there for the last uh, 30 or 40 years. A is because the user experience is designed to be point-to-point, -point, a developer IDE device. And number two is because the, uh, the connectivity in, in, in the traditional control system is thought to be, hey, from the uh, from sort of point-to-point -point as opposed to, to a network as a system. So really, the, the, what we thought about saying, hey, what does this, what does the future need to go look like? What does the infrastructure need to go look like if you want to enable collaborative workers? What does the infrastructure need to look like if you want to be able to, uh, to have machines to machines connect easily? And how do you do that in a way that's actually con uh, consistent with the industry constraints that we actually have? So in, in looking at this if two years ago, we said, hey, listen, what, what's some of the stuff that's actually working out there that we can take advantage of, you know? Point number one, think about software and its role. Best article I've read in a long time, why software is eating the world. There's a corollary called why cloud is eating the world. Mark Andersen wrote the first one of those. And the idea is if you're in an industry and that has not been transformed through software and you're not the one transforming it, you're going to be done, right? That's, a, that's the fundamental of the idea. Classic example is people talk about borders versus Amazon and digital publishing. But you can just sort of look around and it's actually happening everywhere. So point number two, we thought about the role of connectivity and fundamentally how do we actually use the public infrastructure to connect control systems. Now the, the pe people would typically say you cannot do that because the reliability is actually not there. Yes, we have some constraints, but the reality is today one out of three minutes of international calling runs on Skype. A third of the Skype connections are actually video. That's high bandwidth, high traffic, pretty highly reliable stuff. So there's a lot of capability out there that can be taken advantage of. You know, point number three. Computing power on demand. You know, the traditional control system was, you know, one person, one, one device. You know, you can actually today stand up, you know, a thousand servers on a farm in an afternoon if you just uh, partner with the right provider. How do we actually think about customers accessing elastic power? Because the, the need, the computing needs when you're sort of developing, simulating versus operating a system are dramatically different, you know? Point number four, I gotta learn how to use this thing correctly is this idea of rethinking the IDE. And, and our fundamental idea was, how does one think about a collaboration framework? And there's sort of a progression here when you, th when you think about what's on the page. Number one, traditional example, Wikipedia. You know, why, does this, why do we put this thing in the page? Because the reality is communities today create more trustworthy common, uh, content than individuals. Because they self-check, because they validate each other. Think about you know, how you choose things on your, web, on your web store based upon recommendations of others. You know? Point number two, and uh, this is not a necessarily an endorsement for Salesforce.com or any other supplier, this idea of a cloud-based platform that can be extended with third-party applications. This is not just about having a single application, but really cr having an application framework that people can create content on it. The other el element that's, uh, that's important in here is this notion that you can have secure data or critical data in a, in a cloud-hosted environment. And point number three, this idea of selling intellectual, uh, intellectual property online. We, if you think about someone like Topcoder, I think today probably the largest you know, software organization in the world without really having any developers, you know, 400,000 members, and really a, 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 it enables a marketplace of buyers and sellers 
of, uh, of intellectual property. So I thought is how do we actually combine all of those into our world? And really the, the hypothesis, if we want to go transform our world, if you're going to just make that in other machines possible, you got to start by leveraging the technology that's actually empowering, empowering the world. So to test that hypothesis, we went out there and said, we looked at an industry. We looked at the water industry specifically. And if you look at this picture, that's where there's people that have expertise in the water area. And then if you look at the right-hand side, that's where you have water treatment facilities. If you're a fast counter, 42,000 dots on the right-hand side of the page, okay? And what we went is we went to, the, uh, to that industry and said, hey, would you consider doing things differently, you know? Would you consider going into a place where you can engage with your neighbors and, and basically, you know, connect into a digital community that brings together the content expertise? Would you actually consider evaluating solutions for the control space that would be hosted in there, provided by a variety of vendors? And finally, if you were to procure one of those things, would you actually operate your facility from, uh, from that space? And we actually used water because this is a place where you know, these, the, uh, we had a lot of small customers to go validate with. And we actually got some phenomenally resounding yes answers to that. Then we went out and, and said, hey, if you're a large customer instead, what really changes? And frankly, the only thing that changes are the boundaries of, of the problem, right? The community may be your, the other employees in a, in, our, in a space. For example, if you're an oil company, you're probably not going to go share your, inf your information with the next oil company. You know, the catalog of applications are probably your own internal certified applications. And really, you still operate the system the way you operate your system. So in that context, context, we said, hey, what does our infrastructure need to go look like to support that? And here's a place where there's a bit of a difference between how we think about things in the control world and, and how we think about cloud in other spaces. So the, and that's this idea of a high-performance computing at the edge node. You know, at the end of the day, we can develop a distributed system, a cloud-based system, but we need to make sure that things still continues to work untethered. You know, if I have an oil well somewhere in the middle of the desert and I lose connectivity, uh, the environmental impact of a failure is just so high that nobody's just going to go and say, hey, just run this thing from uh, you know, Niska Yuna, New York. So part of the solution, we believe, has to have still a, a, a strong element of computing power at the edge. Number two is reinvent the IDE. Forget the IDE. Build it on the cloud. Essentially build a cloud-based platform to go do that. And number three is make sure you can connect to the thousands of points of data that make a control system into a control system. So let me tell you a little bit more about those. Why did we... Uh, on the idea of more power at the edge node, basically what we did is we sort of amped by 10 the computing power that's packaged into something that can live at, you know, minus 40, at plus 70, at, you know, high shock and vibe, et cetera. And basically we made it so that the traditional stuff would continue to work and you would actually have a lot of extra computing power to have this thing be part of a cloud-connected infrastructure. We're actually using a concept of uh, virtualization in real time. So if you think about uh, the type of, of stuff you see on, a, on your data, data server farm, we're bringing that type of thinking all the way down to the real-time layer. And we make sure that these systems can connect to whatever they need to go connect. And then uh, we make sure that it, we have sort of plug-and-play connectivity to the, broader, to the broader network over a variety of different, a variety of different protocols. You know? The more exciting transformation is probably this idea of using the cloud as a collaborative IDE and operation platform. So basically what we wanted to provide our customers was one point of connect from any device, you know, the ability to collaborate with others in whatever, in whatever uh, community they, they deemed was appropriate, right? It was an industry-wide community, it was a company-wide community, it was a project-based community, the same way that you actually put a fence around your Facebook uh, uh, persona if you want. And number three is that as you did work, we actually we want to make sure that we were taking care of all the digital content for this. So, so what does this actually look like? I mean, today, you know, we're actually prototyping with customers and we'll be actually commercially launching at the beginning of next year a platform that allows a customer from any device to log in to his, to his world on the cloud, essentially join the communities of interest. So, and this could be, like I said, industry, project, uh, or, uh, you know, company, wh whatever boundaries actually make sense, join multiple of them, they make sense, personalize the experience for nev with everything from dashboards to the actual tools that are actually, uh, that are associated with them, use the environment to go build and consume applications. So basically, in addition to the traditional model that would allow you to quote unquote program your, your system, you can basically pick from content that others have created and integrate that in a standardized manner, deploy that to a device anywhere in the world, and then just uh, turn around and, and operate that. And we were able to do that, or we're doing that in, in, a, in a way that's actually consistent with some of the security requirements of our industry, you know, the uh, content management requirements of our industry, and essentially the promise of, of collaboration we actually had, uh, we had talked about. So, so what did we learn? You know, it looks so easy when you talk about this thing on PowerPoint. 
you know, frankly, three things. You know, number one is you've got to combine a long-term vision and short cycle execution. Uh, for us, this is actually a pretty transformational type of experience. It's a completely different way of doing things, and you're going to go wrong 90% of the time. You're off course. It's like going to the moon. You're off course 90% of the time. Know the destination you're trying to shoot for the moon. Course correct all the time. And there's a place where, and I'm just going to agree with what Dave said in the, in the uh, chat before, is Agile helps in the context of an architectural framework that makes sense. And that's actually what we did. We, we looked at two concepts. Obviously, we use Agile to, to know that uh, to know where we are all the time. And we, we, yeah, we applied this sort of concept of a lean startup, or and primarily this concept of minimum viable product to keep validating our, our thinking. It's amazing how much effort gets thrown sideways onto activities that are cool, but not necessarily essential. You know, that was actually that was a big, big learning for us. And the final thing is, if you're going to go and transform your surf, yourself, just uh, apply a strong learning mindset. I'm going to illustrate it with one final story. When we started the idea of cloud for us, we were not super imaginative. We said, hey, what if we were to create an app store for control systems? That was the initial, the initial vision. From app store for control solutions to fully integrated IDE that you can manage the entire life cycle, there's a pretty big gap between those two. And frankly, what happened is we validated our first thinking. And what we found out, customers said, yeah, that's cool, but I only buy one of these things every two years. Well, project dead in the water, right? So be prepared to adapt. I think if you do those three things, you can actually have a pretty transformational effect on the, on the industry that you play in. That's what we're trying to do. So thank you.